Hi, this is a conversation with David Dalrymple, and uh, he's an independent researcher in biophysics and computer science in San Francisco. Uh, David, um, what made you take the decision of uh, leaving your studies and move to California? Well, it was a complex decision with a lot of factors. Uh, I had previously spent a summer in California at Singularity University, and I really got exposed to what I consider the magical atmosphere of the Bay Area. Um, and the way that I contrast it with the East Coast, where I was studying in Boston, is when you have a cool idea in Boston uh, and you describe it to, to people, the usual response is something like, well, that sounds cool, but why would you do it? What's the, what's the purpose? Whereas if you have a cool idea in the Bay Area and you tell people, I have this cool idea, the usual response is more like, well, that's great. Why aren't you already doing it? What's stopping you? And that inversion of polarity is really, was really helpful for my personality. Um, when I first went out for Singularity University, being in that context where it's really hard to think that anything is impossible, really encouraged me to broaden my scope from what I was doing, which was basically all computer-based. I was doing artificial intelligence, programming languages, computer architectures, all, all in the computer science field. And I realized that I had something to contribute, not just in computer science, but also in neuroscience. Uh, that there were problems that uh, could be solved with the aid of new technologies that, that I could address. And so coming back from Singularity University, I changed my focus from being purely a computers guy to being also a neuroscience guy. And uh, that, that's what prompted me to move from MIT to Harvard. I joined the biophysics program, took a lot of neuroscience classes. Um, but then I couldn't, I couldn't stay away from, from California. Um, I, I was a sort of... Uh, paused, I was, um, I was confronted with the bureaucracy of uh, creating a project as a graduate student in, uh, in a big university where everyone really is expected to have their own projects. Um, when you publish a thesis, it's a work of, of authorship. You wrote this thesis, you did the experiments, you had the ideas, and of course the professor contributes here and there and, and takes some credit for it, but collaboration is really not rewarded in, um, in that kind of setting. And being able to use the expertise of someone from a different field, it's very difficult. You can do it, and it takes a lot of effort, and it's not rewarded. Um, whereas in, in the Bay Area, everyone is pretty much free. There's, there's communication across companies, engineers from Apple hang out with engineers from Google, and they, and they cross-pollinate ideas. And, and it's very easy to interact with people from different fields and get different perspectives and even bring people onto a team. Whereas as, as a graduate student, you really can't form a team. It's, it's really looked down upon if, you, if, you're, if you're relying on someone else to do any part of your, of your academic work. Um, so those are some of the factors that went into it. And really, I've just been much happier in California than, than I was before. And that alone is enough justification for me. David, can you tell us about uh, Laboratorium? So the Laboratorium is the culmination of a desire that I've had for probably about as long as I can remember. The first time I heard of Bell Labs, a place where the greatest applied physicists and the greatest engineers and the greatest mathematicians all worked at the same time on the same kinds of problems. Um, I wanted to be there. But it turns out that the Bell Labs where those things happened doesn't really exist anymore. Although there's still an organization called Bell Labs, the trademark has been handed down from one company to another. And really, ever since the breakup of Bell in 1986, there hasn't been a Bell Labs in that sense. Um, I was really excited again when I learned about Xerox Park, and there's also still an organization called Xerox Park, and it's very similar in spirit. You have engineers and scientists working together, building really new kinds of devices, new kinds of tools for people doing all sorts of work, and that also doesn't really exist, not in the way that people talk about it in the stories from where the personal computer was invented. Nothing like that has been invented there since Xerox kind of fumbled the future, as it were, and caused the personal computer to be an Apple product instead of a Xerox product. And um, what I've always wanted to create an environment like that, a place where I can work alongside the, the most interesting people that I know um, on the most interesting problems that we can think of. And the laboratorium is, is my first real attempt to, to do this. Um, the building um, was really the impetus to start working on this. There's this wonderful structure 
called the Palace of Fine Arts, which is the only surviving structure from the 1915 World's Fair in San Francisco, which is one of the first places electric lighting was exhibited. Uh, they had a Palace of Transportation on the fairgrounds, which was a working Model T factory uh, where people were building cars. And this is like a, a, a remarkable exhibition of the latest technological developments. And this one building stands and had been used as a science museum for the past 40 years or so called the Exploratorium which is one of the best science museums in the country and still exists. But this year, in order to move closer to the sort of tourist neighborhood, they left behind the Palace of Fine Arts. And so for this year, that building is being rented temporarily by a private school. But the city is starting to think about what use this historical structure could have um, beyond the coming year. And so I heard about this back in February. The Exploratorium's moving out. This is an you know, epic place that we really want it to be used for something awesome. You know, we don't want it to be an indoor sports facility. And so I started thinking, what, what would we need if we wanted to take this building? What, what it's, what's actually the challenge here? And it was sort of like this story of, a, of an accountant who rode across the Atlantic because she just had a dream about rowing across the Atlantic and started researching. What would it really take? What are the obstacles? Why is it so hard to row across the Atlantic? And the more that you think about why is it so hard to do something that seems impossible, it usually turns out that you wind up with a list of all the things that you need to do, and then you could start checking them off and doing them. And so I've talked to the city government. You know, I've talked to the Parks and Rec Department, which owns it. I've talked to the district supervisor. I've talked to the mayor's office and the Office of Innovation. And I've talked to local entrepreneurs like Peter Thiel, who are interested in having more kinds of radical science. You know, there's a lot of talk in the Bay Area about oh, everything's about apps. We need more. We need more moonshots and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's certainly a zeitgeist. There's a, there's a feeling in the air that we need to have a space like this, as, like, like Bell Labs used to be. And I, it's, everything's coming together. The remarkable thing about this project has been no one that I've talked to has said, no, nah, that's not really a good idea. The worst response that I've gotten is, well, that's great, but I'm worried that other people might not think it's a good idea. And, but no one actually does. And you can introduce them to each other and say, see, you both think it's a good idea. Isn't that great? Let's do it. And it's, it seems to be coming together. So we'll, uh, we'll be doing some renovations on the space, putting in um, various kinds of facilities. Uh, the way that I'm thinking about this is really as a resource. We're creating a resource for scientists to work together. It's going to include a machine shop, wet lab space, a laser lab. Um, computer labs, a library, which is not shelves of books, but actually a book printing machine, so that any book that you want from the internet you can have in, in minutes. And we're also going to have exhibition spaces, kind of in homage to the Exploratorium. We'll have installation art reflecting the latest aspects of science and technology, and even working prototypes from devices that are being built in the labs for members of the public to come in and, and enjoy and to uh, experience. And we'll also have classrooms. Uh, we'll have a great resource of people who know a lot about a lot of things and who enjoy sharing their passions. And this is modeled on a program at MIT that I worked with called the Educational Studies Program. And we bring in high schoolers and middle schoolers to MIT and have the MIT undergrads teach them because they're really excited. I just learned about quantum mechanics. Let me teach you about it, high schoolers. And this actually works remarkably well. They don't get paid. They do this because, because it's really fun. And also because in the process of preparing a course where you have to teach people who know a lot less than you, you learn a lot yourself about how the material is organized and what the structure of that knowledge really is. So we'll have that aspect in addition to a maker space, which will be open for sort of qualified members of the public and go through training sessions to learn to use some of the research resources. Uh, so people will be able to do their own projects in the laboratorium and, and aspire to have their own lab in sort of the, the big kid section. Um, it, you can go all the way from being an interested member of the public to being a working researcher within this one building. Speaking of passions and fun, David, what makes you, what excites you? What, wh when do you feel like, wow, this is it? Uh, there are a lot of things that excite me. Uh, the, the most specific description I can give of the thread that runs through all of my work is I look at the organization of information processing systems. And when I find an organizational principle, and I can say, ah, this works because the information uh, content is monotonic, or this works because of lateral symmetry, or this works because I can see that the abstraction applies across all the domains. That's when I really get excited. I like to, I like to find these principles that you can really 
uh, find uses for in multiple areas and to find connections between different fields. Who are your heroes? Who inspires you? What inspires you? Probably my biggest hero academically is John von Neumann, um, arguably the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. He formalized quantum mechanics as a mathematical system for the first time. He invented the stored program digital computer, and by extension, all the computers that we use today. And he was a wonderful contributor to the field of artificial life and cellular automata, which is kind of obscure, but happens to be what I did my master's thesis on. And it wasn't until I was already most of the way through that I discovered that most of what I had done was actually done by John von Neumann decades earlier. And he didn't finish it because he died of bone cancer in 1956. And I've actually found that in many of the threads of my work, uh, they turn out to be things that John von Neumann was really getting close to before he passed away, and that no one has really picked up since. And so I, I really like to see myself as kind of the picking up the flag that, that John von Neumann left behind. Uh, other scientific heroes are uh, Richard Feynman, uh, I really admire, and um, <clears throat> Uh, Charles Darwin is, a, is an obvious choice. David, most people would refer to you as an extraordinary person. Uh, do you think that there should be uh, two different kinds of education, one for extraordinary people and one for people who are not extraordinary? Well, I think two kinds of education is far too few. Uh, I, I certainly won't deny that I have extraordinary achievements. I think that's a product not mostly of extraordinary intrinsic intelligence, but mostly of an extraordinary education and extraordinary access to resources. And what I see as really tragic is when there are people who have extraordinary intelligence and who don't have extraordinary access to resources and therefore don't have extraordinary achievements. And that's really a shame. That's a, that's a, that's a loss of potential. Um, I think education should be tailored towards the individual's level of motivation, uh, level of aptitude in different areas, and, and level of interest, and what they really want to pursue, what their, what their goals are, and what their values are. And so I do think that different methodologies of education work better for different sec sections of people. Um, but I really think that the more access to resources you can provide to anybody, the better the outcomes will be. David, thank you very much for sharing these ideas and experiences with us, and thank you too.